Uh, I'm a big connect with a, I'm a co-founder of Immune Systems together with Mariana. Um, my background is in architecture, in architectural practice for a number of years back home in Italy. Uh, before we started to become more and more specialized in passive hours, and our company be, uh, more from being an architectural training provider for passive hours, uh, as well as doing now exclusively consulting for passive hours. Uh, so we moved to the US around 2016, and right about the same time, we became licensed training provider with PHI for the uh, tradesperson training, so the builder training uh, for passive hours. Uh, that was because during the years of the architectural practice, I used to spend a long time every day teaching uh, builders on site on how to install insulation properly, air seal stuff properly, uh, basically how to build better. So uh, eventually we became training provider uh, and now um, our home base is, is here in Colorado. Uh, we still have uh, manufacturing clients in Australia and Europe, uh, and we have started last year licensing out our uh, the, the training uh, curriculum that we developed for the American specific market. So um, I've been going since 2014, uh, and I've started to present our research there since about 2015, give or take. Um, so th that was for me a way when I was not, I was kind of new to the uh, passive house world to kind of connect to uh, international colleagues and kind of seeing what was outside of the I think it's important for the development of what's going on here in the U.S. that we keep an eye on what is happening in internationally. So that's why uh, when for the Chinese conference, I reached out to the PHRM folk to say, hey, maybe doing a summary of my experience there uh, is going to be helpful for everyone. This is tries to be more comprehensive than what I've seen there. So I, I did, I've done a little bit extra research today to put together this presentation. Uh, by the end of the day, uh, there were five sessions going on in parallel at the same time. And I, because I also had some meetings with PHI and other folks. So I'm trying to kind of give a, an overview of what's going on uh, internationally and with focus on China specifically. So I'm going to cover today a little bit of a finite world, which was very impressive in a session at the beginning of the conference, uh, and describe what, is, what the lock-in risk uh, is for our situation with the climate change and the way we build buildings today versus the, drama the dramatic energy and carbon economy. Uh, then we're going to show something that's going on in China with regards to passive house development uh, in large projects as well as uh, components being certified. And then uh, go, like zooming out to seeing what's going on worldwide as far as components and prof professionals uh, uh, in the passive house community. Uh, some news about training and tools for passive house, uh, as well as having an outlook of what's going to come next, uh, especially next year. So uh, this is a China is a large country. The conference was uh, near Beijing in Gaobeidian. It's about an hour southwest of Beijing. This is the enlargement where it is. Um, so, China is a very large country, as I said, uh, it's changing the time I was there. Uh, this was my third time to China. The last time I was there, it was 2007. So, while we have the picture of uh, very problematic air pollution, which is still a problem, uh, my experience there was that uh, there is substantial change and effort uh, especially with transportation, uh, aside from 
point, uh, all the smaller vehicles have switched from the internal combustion engine to becoming electric. So they are very quiet and they scrape right behind you and it's kind of scary. But it's, uh, China's become extremely more quiet than it used to be. Uh, the air quality is still a, a primary issue. And, and uh, go from, uh, meeting 35 or less micrograms of particular material, they're working on that and there's substantial research. And passive house is part of the picture in this, with this. Talking about indoor pollution, there's more than 300 million people that today smoke inside. And so besides just the external pollution, there's substantial uh, work that needs to be done on a cultural level kind of to move people away from these bad habits. And uh, besides air, uh, tap water is still not drinkable in most of the country. So Shenzhen has a goal uh, of having their tap water drinkable by 2025. And this is gonna be a big uh, breakthrough for the country for that. The play session had very good speakers from PHI, the IPCC and other uh, institutions. Uh, in a, Climate crisis is impacting all countries at different levels. Uh, extreme weather events uh, include famine, but also uh, lost jobs. Uh, that that touches Europe as well as North America, not only uh, poorer countries. I saw this picture uh, popping up in the presentations. Like, oh, it's a good thing I moved to <laughs> I moved to the Rocky Mountains because the area I'm from is going to be flooded soon. Uh, uh, to Colorado, um, uh, the skin industry is going through some substantial changes. Uh, as I'm on the board for the AIA Colorado Resiliency Community, and we had the city of Aspen uh, climate action plan on and how, as a skin, as a town that, that developed substantially uh, based on their skin, they have been putting in place policies to kind of promote some. Uh, uh, tourism as well as being just because the climate is a one and a half degree gold temperature increase is still within reach uh, but uh, nonetheless the July 2019 was the hottest month ever recorded with the Tibetan plateau being 40 degrees seven degrees flat warmer than usual so dramatic increase in temperature in uh, fragile climate zones. And the only scenario that could keep the climate change within uh, one of the uh, So uh, most of economies have, have uh, been able to decouple the GDP growth from emission to and it's also true for the U.S. So uh, the U.S. economy have been able, has been able to kind of decouple the GDP increase from CO2 emission, and that is a very good thing. Uh, but nonetheless, this is not enough yet in, in order to meet, us, to meet that uh, one and a half degree uh, goal. And IPCC has to the different scenarios to kind of try and model uh, how we could meet, uh, uh, how we can limit the uh, temperature increase to one and a half degrees. And the bottom line is to have a dramatic reduction. Uh, this is where passive house come into place because uh, while it is easy enough to put PVs and renewables onto buildings, it will be dramatically important to leave the green electricity to other sectors function because for them for for the, these other sectors is much more difficult uh, to achieve that so transportation is much a much harder time uh, in achieving that dramatic demand reduction buildings can reduce the demand of energy by up to 90 percent so while it is important to install renewables on buildings the uh, and net zero is it is fashionable but it is a secondary goal versus, uh, as opposed to the reduction of the demand. Um, if we don't commit 
buildings to becoming less and less uh, demand in terms of energy, we have a lock-in factor. So this is something that when we look at buildings being better than code, you know, uh, 20% better than code is, is something that, uh, yes, they are better than code and they can reach net zero, but uh, whenever we give up the opportunity to uh, reduce the energy demand so dramatically, we commit those buildings to consuming much more energy than the shall call the lock-in factor. And um, there is a disruptive uh, technology in reducing the, the demand and that is passive energy. Uh, we just did last week a one of our feasibility study for a project uh, house. and the, our baseline was the 2018 IECC code, which uh, the the designer had used kind of to develop their uh, uh, the project. We applied passive house envelope components for climbers on seven, and we saw a reduction of heat in the band by 85%. So uh, we the values and, uh, you know, passive house windows and some tips uh, about uh, best practices for the building envelope, we reduced the heat in the band by 14 times compared to a, a brand new code building, 14 times. That is the, uh, the impact that passive house can have and that is the kind of impact we need uh, for our um, so China has come and it is active. You are uh, used to see you will be, you know, there's no chance that this, these buildings are going to be passive house, but these buildings actually. Are. So uh, this is the region uh, where the conference was, the Hebei province, and this region specifically, but China in general, is recognizing the importance of super efficient passive house buildings. And the six years, they've been subsidizing construction of demonstration projects with special funds, as well as just supporting research and development of green building technology and different and new products for the market. Uh, and several cities, uh, not only in this region, but also elsewhere, uh, have introduced relevant uh, incentives, um, uh, this practice of, the practice of passive house in China. Uh, passive house project, this is the development where the, uh, the conference was uh, hosted. It's the Gaubedian Railway City. Uh, uh, Heidelberg is the largest European development using passive house. Uh, Gaubedien is much larger. It has 3.5 million square feet of certified passive house buildings. It's, it's a dramatically large commitment from China uh, for passive house. And just to just having a look at the uh, the flags, this is the international passive house database. Uh, currently, there's 114 buildings registered for the U.S. China is catching up pretty quickly with 44 buildings, although that doesn't really say much about the square footage of the, the total project. Um, moving on to certified components, there's more than 80 certified windows, uh, certified for China. And on top of that, there's cotton walls, there's construction systems and others. So just for the cool temperate climate, which is uh, equivalent to climate zone five in the US. Uh, this is a view of the international uh, component database for passive house, just looking at the Chinese component. Uh, if you go onto the uh, database, you have a chance to scroll down by country, you, you see the options for the uh, I think something that I found particularly interesting, there's a lot of research done in hybrid uh, systems for ventilation. So not only HRVs or ERVs, but also units that combine an ERV with a dehumidification HIPAA. And that is particularly useful in warm humid climate of central and southern China, uh, where they want to build passive house uh, and the climate is warm and humid. Um, uh, zooming 
back up from China world. The trend that has been going on uh, in the past couple of years is that the increase, increasing number of manufacturers of passive house components outside of Europe, mostly in Asia and in the South Pacific. Uh, the, uh, the fresh income and so that uh, passive house is no longer just a European, I mean, most of components still come from Europe, but there's a lot more manufact uh, manufacturers uh, distributed elsewhere. About 2005, it's probably as many. Uh, and South America is developing quite a bit. There's somebody in Africa, uh, and North America is moving along nicely. Um, so speaking of continued education, uh, there are some news. Um, the uh, consultants and designers, as well as tradespeople, um, uh, certification. Passivas has worked uh, some new continued education uh, additional accreditation. Sent a PHPP expert for uh, consultants, especially working on large and non residential projects, as well as uh, trainers. If you want to become a trainer like myself, uh, you undergo a specific training. Some of the tags that you see here are still under development. So, for example, for the tradesperson, there's going to be two additional modules one is for retrofits and one is for site supervisors, uh, but those are not available yet. Um, and uh, uh, so an additional thing is that Passive House, uh, so far as it was possible so far to uh, become accredited as a consultant via an exam or via a certified building, uh, whether as a tradesperson you get accredited via a, an exam and then to re uh, renew your certificate, you have to certify a project. Uh, that is uh, changing and uh, PHI uh, has worked out a continued educa education credit system uh, where if you participate to continued education education with uh, training providers, you get credits uh, and you kind of work your way through uh, your renewal. And I'm going to touch base on this uh, further on in this presentation. Um, we uh, training that we developed for North America. So we uh, became training provider in 2017 using the uh, European uh, curriculum. And in 2018, we started using our North American specific content, including not only the construction uh, methods and different climate zones, but also economic uh, consideration and analysis that we developed for the different markets in, in, in the US specific. And we also develop uh, from scratch the workshop. Most of you probably have seen the passive powered workshop that we do here in Nevada. And we, are, uh, we spent a lot of time developing it in a brand neutral environment so that uh, builders that come to take the class can try out different uh, products without uh, having vendors uh, selling them. Uh, in that because we're, we're not really. Uh, Totally communicated to PHI uh, much about the workshop, so they were pretty excited to see uh, the progress we've been doing. Uh, and besides the workshop, we've been uh, working on some engagement of high schools and uh, you know local communities. So uh, we basically gave feedback to the international community on how to uh, develop the training to become uh, a local source of engagement in the passive house community. Um, uh, talking some news for the design tools, including uh, design PH and uh, PHPP. Design PH, for those of you who don't know it, is a plugin for uh, SketchUp that allows you to model uh, the building envelope in 3D before importing it into PHPP. And um, so, what you see in the picture there at the bottom, the, the red little house is actually the building envelope. And um, this is what the, that what looks that what that is what the model looks like before the 
important. One of the biggest hurdles in PHP overall was modeling the shading correctly. Uh, and so far, um, the input both in design PH and uh, PHP has been through the geometric input where you determine this, the most component in front of your window and that becomes, that is uh, modeled in, in the way that you see. Uh, so if you have a, uh, a single volume that is the darkest spot in the middle of, uh, do you guys see my cursor right now? Okay, so if you have this small volume, you want to model that for this windows, uh, the old geometric input would model this uh, shading object to be infinitely wide. And that is kind of a limitation on how PHPP used to look at the, this 3D ray, uh, ray tracing, meaning that each, uh, for each glaze component, uh, you create a shading mass, so the software generates a shading mass. So what you see is when looking at the high rise. So what you see here when my cursor is, is actually a high rise as, as casting a shadow onto the window. And what you see the, the, the curves with the, the little funny uh, bu bubbles on the, on the right hand side is the apparent sun path of the sun as projected on that window. So ma a much more accurate uh, way to determine the shading factor for that uh, window. And the uh, basically you generate that allows solar gain calculation. Uh, um, you have different ways to set it up. A DIM software, uh, such as uh, Revit Vectorbox or B. Unfortunately, I cannot describe much of it because I have not uh, seen this presentation, but the, this kind of tool is available now and integrates with the BIM software to kind of bridge between in the 3D model uh, without the, the need of design PH. Um, PHP, uh, there's some very refined ways you can use it uh, and start to factor in a changing climate condition as, as well hit the effect or user behavior. So Ian Steiger, that is one of the developers of PHPP, gave a presentation on how to do that. And that is particularly important when you are trying to monitor energy consumption uh, of uh, occupied passive houses with what was modeled. Um, this is the documentation of PHI is that uh, uh, the um, calculation with the existing climate data set, they would be updating those sets because the, uh, the climate data is based on a three decades between 1961 and 1990. About three degrees Celsius higher. Uh, so you can expect a lower heat in demand and higher cooling demand pretty much across the board. Uh, so if you're, if you're trying to compare uh, results from PHPP with actual data that you collect from Built buildings, you should be fine to on these conditions. Uh, PHPP was validated according to ASHRAE uh, 140 earlier uh, in 2019 with a study done by Ramesh Sheridan. Uh, In PHP and National 140 provides different uh, test method tests uh, include uh, addresses uh, um, actually heat and cooling demand, regardless of the time steps. And the way you do it, you compare the uh, results of your software with three dynamic simulation programs. 
and there's not really a pass of failure outcome, but we can see uh, in a second how PHPP did uh, very well. Actually, it was not when I was neither of PHI presenting this uh, uh, this study in China. So this is the uh, heat and demand uh, as calculated. So the the vertical lines show a range calculated for the with the three uh, uh, different and the green dot across is the results of PHP. So for heat and demand, you can see that PHP is pretty much always uh, within the range. And in the uh, cooling demand, there's only one case where P the result of PHP falls outside of that range. So it's pretty good result in terms of accuracy for heating and cooling demand. Uh, SketchUp, uh, Ed May uh, from New York presented a way to manage the gap between the design team and the certification uh, by using uh, the layout part of SketchUp. Uh, and I found that it was very useful and I, I hope PHI picks it up soon uh, because you basically can model uh, all, all, of, all of the information within SketchUp and anybody can go in uh, and, and look at different plots with the building without really the need for 2D drawings that become uh, kind of time intensive and not as accurate. Uh, this, uh, I just, I found some of this information today uh, from Ed's contribution on the Passive House Accelerator, which is a, it's a great resource of information about Passive House um, for North America and, and worldwide. Uh, next conferences, uh, the International Passive House Conference uh, in 2020 is going to be in uh, Germany. In, uh, but then there's going to be the NAPHN conference in New York uh, in June 2011. I think the, uh, I think the, the call for paper for NAPHN uh, is around December, January maybe? I'm not sure. Uh, but um, if, uh, to our region, you know, I just wanted to put in more information about the Fort Collins tour. If you do want to participate, um, please register because the uh, participation, the, the number of participants is limited both at, at the presentation and on site. Um, as Mariana mentioned before, we're very excited because for the first time we have three classes going on at, at the same time. Uh, in different region, we have uh, Colorado, California, and Minnesota. And if you happen to be in Colorado, we have on Wednesday the, the 13th, and uh, we can provide uh, you with continued education credit by just showing up and having a beer with us. Uh, so that is the, in the continued education credits by just participating in the networking and uh, educational activity within the Passive House community, you can, uh, it, it can contribute to your uh, continued education for Passive House. Uh, that being said, uh, this concludes my presentation and I'm open to questions if you have any. That's great. Uh, just a heads up, uh, I'm picking up Brahman. Uh, that technical head to your Open nice. House, and Bronwyn is the president of the North American Bass House Excellent. Network, so um, we get to definitely rub elbows with some of the folks from, from the, at least the national leadership. Nice. That's, of that. that's very exciting to hear. And I heard that you guys ended up on an airplane together in China. We got, we got stuck in the middle of that. <laughs> <laughs> So we, we went through all the things passive as we could talk about and beyond. <laughs> yeah, we got, we got, uh, we met randomly at the airport. If you look up Carmel Town in China on the Silk Route, and we were on the same plane and we cannot fly directly to Beijing. So we, you know, the, the flight stopped in Urumqi and our flight from Urumqi to Beijing got uh, postponed by at least three hours. So, yeah. <laughs> Could you talk a little bit about China itself and the experience, the cultural kind of 
difference or maybe similarities and how passive house kind of works there differently than here or maybe some things are similar uh, the scale is huge um, and it's a very uh, different culture as far as professional relationships um, so it, it was it's kind of, it was it's kind of difficult to it's a very good question i have to say um but i, I don't know if i can so the fact that they've been able to like commercialize so many certified products so quickly compared well, to what we're used to here in the united states where we have maybe half a dozen well well you know if you add that to 20 single family houses or if you have development of five high rises of 20 stores each the just the order of magnitude it's, it's an economy of scale so uh, i think that matters quite a bit uh, and i think i think they, uh, i mean i know there's some high-end wood frame windows produced in china for the chinese market as well so uh I think, uh, and the fact that there's some subsidies, this kind of construction, uh, I mean, if you have 3.5 million square foot projects certified, uh, manufacturers will get on board in my mind. En Enrico, can, can you speak to the behind how much of it is mandated versus the people just taking it upon themselves to do it or are they public projects uh, etc so i know by speaking with brown so i did not participate to the tour for example some projects in beijing uh, the developers got some extra square footage allowed to be built being built if they build at least one project uh, certified passive house. So um, I think it's incentivized uh, also by, you know, allowing extra uh, square footage by having at least some of it uh, support the standard. Right, right. Uh, Shifting gears, related. Re re is it currently available for use with Revit, or is it? Are you were you just announcing that it is going to be available? So, so the Beam Two PH, which is the plugin that I was talking about for to connect BIM to P, uh, PHP, I believe that that is available today. Uh, okay. As I believe because I did not have a chance to assist. Uh, to that presentation, but if, I think if you Google uh, BIM two PH, uh, you... yeah, the dedicated site for that plugin, and I haven't used it either. Um, but yeah, it's out there um, in the wild, and it's a two point oh, right? So I think it's a somewhat mature. Uh, uh, I, for, I this is for Revit we're talking about specifically? Yeah. Yes. Right. Yeah, I think it works with Betterworks and Archicad and uh, talking with people, something like they were talking like they are using it. So it's not something that is coming soon, but it's something that is being used right now. It's on our, I think, I believe it's on our resources page, Passive House Rocky Mountains resources page. And if it's not, I'll link to that. I'll put that link on the resources page. Page. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know anybody who's using it currently in the United States either. And then um, another design page question. So you talked about the improvements to the shading aspect. So was the shading devices were either opaque or they were non-existent. There was no way to model um, 
you know, some openings in those devices. I assume that's, that's taken care of now. Yes, to the point that uh, if you have substantial deciduous trees, you can model those one with one model for the winter time and one for the summertime with the with the leaves. Nice. So, yes, yeah. yeah. And there's and there's uh, certain rules of rules of times as far as the size of your glaze not uh, unit by unit. So if you have a two sash, this mass would be for each of the sashes. Uh, and so depending on the size of your individual glass area, uh, you're going to have multiple measuring points. So you can have at least, it starts from one in the middle or all the way up to 16 different points where from each point you project the, the rays. And depending on the types and complexity of your shading, you can have a, a, a lower or more or less, uh, um, more or fewer of those rays. So multiple points of measurement and different accuracy for each point. So it's a very accurate uh, calculation method. So it may actually, as a group, would be interested in talking with him to present on one of these monthly meetings about as well. Um, yeah. yeah. That's pretty deep into the. That's a good idea. Yeah, that's pretty deep into the woods, but at the same time, it really does show the power of uh, energy modeling and the precision that we can achieve now. So um, if that's something you guys think is worthwhile, um, we're willing to I see do. if he's willing to introduce that. Yeah. So that's right. Yes, yes. Yes. Hardy Gung Ho, yes. Okay, yeah, I saw the person four seven five uh, hosted a presentation with them about uh, that, that the new version uh, last month. So, mm. so well, to the fore because I think uh, you know I think uh, to that's to the point where we as practitioners really need to keep our you know thumbs on what's happening in the general pastoralist world. Mm -hmm. uh, as far as tools and accessibility to uh, uh, the methodologies, uh, current methodologies as well here. So, okay. So who's going to China? <laughs> it's a fun place. What's the food like? Well, different? Yeah, it's, yeah, it's very good. What's the weirdest thing you ate? This time, uh, mutton feet, I think. What is that? Mutton feet. Okay. Not in Beijing. This, this was afterwards. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It was very good. And did you climb any mountains when you were in China? No, no. I went, I went to a small town and stayed there. Just people watching was amazing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> they were watching. I had so many pictures taken of me, <laughs> you know. <laughs> I was, I was, yeah, it was a fun place. So I got a question. Did, yeah. did you struggle with um, Montezuma's Revenge or anything like that? Keep going. <laughs> oh, uh, no, not, not really this time, no. Uh, the very first time I went, it was, yeah. <laughs> no, nah, but this time, no. Also, I was more aware of staying, uh, you know, fresh dairy and stuff like that. So, yeah, with some precaution, it's, you know, I had, I had a much harder time in India for that, with that regard. <laughs>